And now for the Solid series. It's where I started. It's where a lot of people started. And you know what I have to thank for getting me into this series of terrorism, nuclear deterrence, and one man's journey to delve into a global conspiracy he has no hopes of comprehending? Pokemon. Yep, as weird as it sounds, I have Pokemon to thank for getting me into the series. Let's set the clock back to 1999. I was in middle school and the trading card game was what everyone talked about. Maybe I already mentioned this story in my Pokemon trading card game review, but one day a friend of mine gave me his copy of Metal Gear Solid in exchange for my holographic Kangaskhan. Now why did I agree to that? Because I was getting a PlayStation game for a shiny piece of cardboard. It could have been fucking Blasto and I would have agreed to it. This is it right here. I've had this since 1999. The case is cracked in a few areas and the disc could be in much better condition but I was still able to partake in Hideo Kojima's next adventure in the Metal Gear Saga. And speaking of Kojima, let's talk about what the man did between games. Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake was released in 1990, while Metal Gear Solid was of course released in 1998. Did he simply go into hibernation all those years? Uh, no. Kojima's worked on a number of unrelated games that, while they didn't have the same draw as Metal Gear, they're considered cult favorites nonetheless. There was Snatcher, an adventure game with cyberpunk elements initially created in 1988 for the PC-8801, with Americans not seeing it until 1994 for the Sega CD, and then there was Police Knots, another adventure game exclusive to Japanese markets with emphasis on sci-fi and film noir, released in the mid-90s for the NEC PC-9801, the Panasonic 3DO, the PlayStation, and the Sega Saturn. I'd love to take a look at these two at some point, especially Snatcher. I've heard good things about that one. These two, along with Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, firmly established that Kojima just wasn't into creating games, he wanted to tell stories. Remember, the man wanted to be a film director at first, but he decided to use video games as the basis to share his concepts, and starting with the Metal Gear Solid series, it really begins to show. Everyone knows it. The Solid series is known for a lot of things. Stealth, cardboard boxes, mullets, and a shitload of dialogue. We're not at the worst of it yet, but Metal Gear Solid is certainly chattier than every other game Kojima has produced before it, and this is a precaution I throw out now. If you're thinking of getting into the series at all, if you haven't already, prepare yourself. At many points, it will feel like you're watching a movie instead of playing a game. This is no Mario Brothers, this is no Sonic the Hedgehog, it's not even Final Fantasy. This is Metal Gear Solid, a Hideo Kojima game. <laughs> Now, if you're worried about being out of the loop starting with Metal Gear Solid instead of the MSX games, Kojima's got you covered. You can catch up on the events that transpired in the first two Metal Gear games thanks to the previous operations feature inside the title menu, although I'm pretty sure the CIA operative that helped me in Metal Gear 2 was named Holly and not Hori. Oh dear. And before I begin my plot summary, I just want to note that these videos are not going to be super in-depth studies of Metal Gear's themes or about what it's trying to achieve with its abundance of political and social commentary. I'm looking at these games with a very general set of eyes. After all, if you're a fan of the series, then you already know what you like about the games, but can I recommend them to an average Joe who doesn't know what a Metal Gear is? Well, let's find out, and this one's pretty loaded. It's been about six years after the events of Metal Gear 2. A renegade faction of Foxhound Special Forces begin an uprising at a nuclear disposal facility in Alaska codenamed Shadow Moses, and they're threatening to launch a nuke in 24 hours if they don't receive the remains of the legendary soldier Big Boss. If you're wondering what in the hell's left of the man after Snake burned him alive last time, Naomi, if you would. His body was burned severely, but it was possible to restore his DNA profile from just a single strand of his hair. There you go, science. For a second time, Solid Snake is brought out of retirement and the poor bastard is probably left wondering why he even bothers at this point. But it gets a little more personal this time. Besides the former Colonel Campbell and Lightning Snake that his niece Meryl is being held hostage inside the facility, Snake is also educated on the members of Foxhound leading this revolution. First up, we have Decoy Octopus, a master of disguise, Vulcan Raven, a giant shaman with a huge fascination for ravens, Psycho Mantis, your residential psychopath with powers of telepathy and psychokinesis, Sniper Wolf, a deadly sharpshooter, Revolver Ocelot, another person with a gun as far as we're aware, and finally the leader of the bunch, Liquid Snake, who looks very identical to our hero and is an absolute ham. Now I'll finish the work that father began. I will surpass him. I will destroy him. You're just like Naomi. Well, I'm not like you. But when there are new bad guys, there are some good guys to go with it. Snake has a few new buddies on his side for support. Colonel Campbell and McDonald Miller return to give Snake advice on survival, but now we also have Naomi Hunter, chief of Foxhound's medical staff that supplies Snake with nanomachines to keep him up to snuff. What are nanomachines? Magic. There are different types which will replenish the supply of adrenaline, nutrition, and sugar in your bloodstream. 
Now I don't have to worry about food. I also put some nootropics in there. Say what? Nootropics. A class of drugs which will help improve your mental functioning. It'll make me smarter, huh? Anything else? Yes. Benzedrine. Hot damn. Next up is Mei Ling, the inventor of Snake's new Soliton radar system that helps him track enemy activity on a level greater than the radar he had last time. She's also how you save your game, not that I think Snake has any idea what that means. And last up is Nastasha Romanenko, probably the one that contains the least amount of significance to the overall plot. She's often just a means to provide some interesting tidbits on the many weapons Snake can once again procure on his mission. Snake is sent to Shadow Moses for two primary reasons. One to rescue the DARPA chief, Donald Anderson, and the president of arms tech, Kenneth Baker. The second reason is to find out if Liquid Snake and his friends are full of shit and actually have a means to launch a nuclear weapon. Unfortunately, they do. Not long after infiltrating the base, Snake locates the DARPA chief, and he informs Snake on the new model of Metal Gear, codenamed Rex. It's huge, it's bipedal, and it can launch a nuke to any point of the world. We're two videos in and I'm already getting deja vu. The DARPA chief and Kenneth Baker were kidnapped because Foxhound knew of the two-part detonation code the two men shared to make it possible to launch the nuke, and much to Snake's dismay, they already figured out the DARPA chief's half of the code. Luckily, Mr. Anderson tells Snake of a method to disarm Metal Gear, a POW key, but immediately after telling him that, the man suddenly dies of a heart attack. I hate when that happens. Confused, but nevertheless pressed for time, Snake continues forward and unexpectedly runs into Meryl, Colonel Campbell's niece that's a little green but manages to help Snake thwart some security forces before making a quick getaway in the confusion. And just a little while after that, Snake succeeds in finding Kenneth Baker, but he's not alone. He's immediately introduced to Revolver Ocelot, who just loves spinning that goddamn gun. The two trade gunshots for a bit, but a random ninja suddenly enters the scene, cutting off Ocelot's hand and rescuing Baker from some close-range C4, though explosions going off this close to the man's body should have killed him anyway. Ocelot gets away, the ninja mysteriously vanishes, and Snake shares some alone time with Baker, who elaborates on why Metal Gear Rex exists in the first place. For a president of a company in charge of weapons development, war is money after all, and Metal Gear Rex was his ticket to wealth. But thanks to the terrorist managing to get his code, well, that doesn't seem to be happening. With the terrorists in possession of both detonation codes, things look bleak, but Baker tells Snake the location of the POW key, which happens to be in Merrill's possession. He also shares the identity of the man who designed Metal Gear Rex, Dr. Hal Emmerich, who's located somewhere in the base that can hopefully provide Snake with some insight on the walking death Mobile. Baker then suddenly dies from a heart attack just like the DARPA chief, prompting Snake to believe something fishy's going on here, with Campbell not helping and easing his doubts. It's like he doesn't even try. Colonel, are you listening? Now he's dead too. I have no idea. Don't lie to me. Snake is quick to make contact with Marrow after looking at the back of the CD case, and the two spend some time getting to know each other. They agree to physically meet up so they can make their way to the communications tower, but along the way Snake encounters Vulcan Raven, taking the hero head on inside a fucking tank, which Snake then counters with nothing but grenades. But it works, and Snake even runs into the ninja again while looking for Dr. Hal Emmerich, with a mysterious cyborg claiming to know Snake, prompting a hand-to-hand -hand battle. The ninja is then revealed to be... Gray Fox, who didn't quite die after Metal Gear 2 and became a cybernetic ninja after being experimented on for four years. Something Naomi Hunter seems to know more details of, but noticeably hesitates to elaborate on when asked. Snake and Hal Emmerich finally meet, with Hal turning out to be a totally oblivious geek, a man who yearned to use science to help people thanks to his love of anime, completely unaware that his ultimate creation is being used to launch nuclear weapons instead. This kind of destroys him inside, but Snake snaps him out of it and they agree to work together to stop Metal Gear Rex from launching. Hal even gives himself the code name of Otacon, named after an otaku convention. Snake is able to locate Meryl after staring at some asses for a bit, that makes more sense in context, believe me. Meryl hands over the PAL key to Snake and the two begin to head out, but not before getting mind fucked by Psycho Mantis, using all sorts of creative methods to break the fourth wall. You like Castlevania, don't you? But he's dealt with eventually, allowing Snake and Meryl to move forward, but then Meryl gets shot multiple times with a sniper rifle by Sniper Wolf. Since he's unable to do anything about it then and there, Snake has to backpedal in order to locate a sniper rifle to deal with the femme fatale, but when he gets back, Meryl is gone. Look, backtracking will do that, I'll get on that later. Anyway, Snake deals with Sniper Wolf, but with Meryl gone, it's a very empty victory, and to make matters worse, he's caught by some soldiers soon after, and they're led by Sniper Wolf, who is apparently bulletproof. She doesn't have a single goddamn scratch on her after being shot multiple times with a sniper rifle! Snake is knocked unconscious and finds himself bounded in an interrogation room after waking up, with Revolver Ocelot and Liquid Snake serving as his house guests. The two snakes meet face to face for the first time here, but we're not at the end of the game yet, so it's short-lived. 
Ocelot proceeds to torture Snake to gain info on the POW key, threatening to kill the kidnapped Meryl if he doesn't comply, but in between sessions, Snake manages to escape thanks to this soldier having IBS and Otacon providing a means to get out. He also finds the decomposing body of the DARPA chief in his cell, which confuses Snake as he just saw the man die only a few hours ago, with decomposition normally taking days to occur. The questions continue to pile on, but Snake keeps on pressing. He reaches the communications tower near the underground base where Metal Gear is being held, and he encounters Liquid piloting a Hind D. You'd think Snake would be outmatched, but let's remember, Snake destroyed a tank earlier with nothing but fucking grenades. Liquid is taken out in a fiery explosion thanks to Snake's use of Stinger missiles, and by God, we're finally at the underground base! That is, after dealing with Sniper Wolf for a second time, she may be bulletproof, but nothing can stop a remote-controlled missile. But suspicions continue to rise behind the scenes when Naomi ends up being not who she claims to be. She's caught lying about her origin story when the topic's brought up thanks to Miller, and it appears that she has a bit of a grudge against Snake because of his previous encounters with Gray Fox. Naomi and Gray Fox were quite close, both coming from a rough upbringing, and when Snake seemingly killed Gray Fox in Metal Gear 2, Naomi didn't take that very well. Under the guise of a regular medical shot, Naomi in actuality injected Snake with a retrovirus called Fox Dye, something that can target specific people through DNA and kill them by simulating a heart attack and ends up being what killed the DARPA chief and Kenneth Baker. Now this is where things get really screwy. Naomi was under orders from the Pentagon to inject Snake with the virus so he could deal with the Foxhound members while keeping Metal Gear Rex intact, allowing the United States to hold on to their precious nuclear battle tank. Unbeknownst to everyone, Naomi altered the virus so that it would also kill Snake, an act of revenge for what he did to Gray Fox and Big Boss, since he was responsible for getting Naomi and Gray Fox out of their terrible living conditions. The worst part of all this being Snake has no idea when the virus will kick in and kill him. But Naomi eventually warms up to Snake in some fashion when she sees for herself that Snake is not the malevolent, cold-blooded killer she mistook him for. And that's great and all, but that virus is still inside Snake at the end of the day. It's gonna eventually kill him, and that's fucked up. But in spite of all that, Snake continues his mission. I think at this point, the only thing he cares about is destroying Metal Gear. And after dealing with Vulcan Raven for a second time, he finally manages to use the POW key to prevent the nuclear launch, except the complete opposite happens. Snake ends up arming the nuclear weapon on Metal Gear, and Liquid Snake, who by the way survived the Hind D explosion, mocks Snake for falling into his trap, revealing that he was posing as McDonald Miller the whole time to keep tabs on Snake. Poor McDonald Miller killed off screen like a chump. This entire time, Snake was being manipulated to activate Metal Gear Rex because Liquid was, in fact, unable to get the detonation codes from the DARPA chief after Ocelot accidentally killed him during a torture session. The DARPA chief Snake encounter in the prison cell earlier was actually Decoy Octopus, using his mastery of disguise to set the gears into motion. Too bad about the heart attack, though. I'm afraid to ask, but if this entire operation was a ploy to get Snake to activate Metal Gear, wasn't Liquid kinda going overboard with some of these traps? I mean, a tank battle, the Hind D, all the soldiers surrounding the area. I know Snake is a legendary mercenary and all that, but if he died, that's it. There goes the plan. Metal Gear Rex is activated with Liquid in the pilot seat. Our hero isn't able to do much to the gargantuan Metal Beast, but Gray Fox unexpectedly shows up to aid Snake, using an arm cannon that he suddenly has for some reason to expose Liquid in the cockpit, allowing Snake to attack him directly with Stinger missiles. On Unfortunately, this cost Gray Fox his life, and he soon amounted to a stain on the floor. Snake is finally able to destroy Metal Gear Rex, but Liquid again survives the blast and then proceeds to dump a shitload of info on Snake all at once. There's a reason these two look identical. They're both the result of Les Enfants Terribles, a scientific experiment where clones of Big Boss were created to replicate his amazing abilities as a soldier. Liquid, however, views himself as the inferior clone while considering Snake to be the dominant one, so he wants Snake out of the picture while also fulfilling Big Boss's dream, using his remains to perfect his soldiers and create a world full of war, giving them purpose and all that, outer heaven. I am so exhausted by all this exposition by now that when Snake and Liquid have one last battle on top of the damaged Metal Gear, I'm doing everything I can to clobber the shit out of him for making me listen to him rant. Liquid falls to his death and Snake finds Meryl remarkably alive. They can't spend too much time together though, as Shadow Moses is being bombed to hell with airstrikes that were ordered from the Secretary of Defense. Revealed to be the one behind the Fox Dye injection and wants to cover up the existence of Metal Gear and everything that occurred on the island with a nuclear strike. Snake and Meryl find an escape route and take off via a commandeered jeep, but Jesus Christ, Liquid is once again alive to give our hero shit. He's an android, he's gotta be a fucking android. That or he has auto life, but no, he's human after all. Liquid collides with their jeep and has the two lovebirds pinned to the ground, but before he can finish them off, Liquid is finally, finally killed by the Fox Dye virus inside Snake. So there's that.
The Secretary of Defense is arrested after it's discovered that he was acting alone, under the President's nose, and Campbell is placed back in charge of the operation. Naomi insists that Snake live the rest of his life to the fullest, and Snake happily obliges, exiting Shadow Moses Island alongside Merrill in a snowmobile. As for Otacon, uh, he's somewhere around. He sort of disappears after helping Snake and Merrill escape the island, but we don't physically see him again unless you get the bad ending where Merrill dies, but that isn't considered canon. Metal Gear Solid was one of my first cinematic experiences in a video game. Cutscenes with actual choreography, full-fledged voice acting, most of which I think still holds up tremendously well, and a story that felt so compelling and immersive, it was an adventure for my 12-year-old mind. Today I'm still enjoying a lot of elements from it, but certain things rub me the wrong way. I'm frankly surprised Snake didn't speak up sooner when he began to see his superiors deliberately hiding information for the sake of the mission. Now Campbell eventually explained his reasoning. The Secretary of Defense was essentially holding Merrill captive by intentionally placing her inside Shadow Moses during the uprising, but that's revealed at the end game. Until then, Campbell has to carefully relay only a certain amount of information to Snake, but he's so bad at lying. And to be fair, that's a plot point. Snake calls him out on that repeatedly, but that's the problem, repeatedly. How much longer could Snake realistically put up with that without compromising the mission. He hates being kept in the dark, and he learns early on that he's being kept in the dark, but he doesn't do anything about that. In a way, it makes Snake look foolish, leading into another problem I have with Snake. It feels like 80% of his dialogue is just asking questions, repeating something someone just told him for the sake of the player getting an explanation. I mean, goddamn. Invited. Nano machines. Revolution. Metal Gear. Rex. Woman. Who? You mean Metal Gear. Colonel. Any questions, Snake? Questions. There are ways to inform the player on what certain things mean without making Snake look like a clueless adult. This guy's supposed to be a badass mercenary, not a parrot. And this is a totally frivolous complaint, but the end game reveals Snake's name to be David. Come on. Solid Snake is a name to be feared. David is my neighbor down the street. I know it's meant to humanize the guy and all that, but I don't know. Kind of sucks away some of the mystique, but I, I kid, I kid. I wish I had the ability to really dive into the screenwriting here, but... I'm a bit of a simpleton, as I said before. I don't feel qualified to examine the deep meaning behind the topics of nuclear deterrence, the war economy, and questioning the integrity of your own country. It's all there for discussion, but that's not why I enjoy the game. The basic plot is enough for me, and all the little moments where the game breaks the fourth wall. It gives the game a quirky sense of humor. The little extra details you can learn from codec conversations are an added bonus. Everyone has something to say about everything that happens in this game. It gives you different outlooks and interpretations, a means to give the story added flavor without forcing it down your throat. God, could you imagine how much longer the story would be if it weren't up to the player's discretion to view this shit? This is a game where you can spend the first 30 to 40 minutes just listening to the mission briefing before Snake even has to sneak around a single guard. Let's put it this way, Metal Gear Solid is around an 8 to 10 hour game. Without cutscenes and codec conversations, it's around 4 hours of pure game time. That's how much emphasis is here on story, and if that doesn't mesh well with you, I'll tell you now, this isn't the series for you. Knowing what to do or knowing where to go requires that you sit back and listen in, repeatedly. If you're up for that, I think you'll enjoy what you see. The narrative is still pretty engaging. There's something there for the casual crowd with enough layers to keep the more sophisticated viewers busy. But like I said, I'm looking at these stories with a very general set of eyes, and I understand that may or may not work later down the road, but it's my job to see if these games can attract your average player. Now for the actual video game of this video game. I feel this is a nice continuation of what Metal Gear 2 established. Snake has always had a multitude of ways getting by undetected, but observing your surroundings is more important than ever now that we're working on a 3D space. Your new Soliton radar system allows you to see your enemy's field of vision, including the range of surveillance cameras, but only when they're in the range of the radar. So utilizing the camera is a crucial element. You can press up against walls to get a different perspective, you can crouch to lower your visibility, and what is undoubtedly the most important feature added here, you can observe things in first person mode. In a game where getting spotted means an ass load of guards swarming you, it's vital for you to always look out ahead of you. It's the only way you'll know what's up ahead during those times where your radar gets jammed, and when you're playing on a higher difficulty where you don't have a radar at all. Every major area of Shadow Moses will have something different for Snake to deal with, with some gimmicks returning from the MSX games like electrified floors and pitfalls, though thankfully those are much easier to avoid now. Card keys are no longer pace breakers as well. The cards stack now when you collect them, thank Christ! And Thanks to texture technology, doors are clearly labeled, so you know from the get-go if it's the door you're looking for. Metal Gear 2 had some memorable sequences, and Metal Gear Solid brings some of them back, and then some, and 
A few are quite hard on the nerves. Even with cigarettes or thermal goggles, getting through the infrared lasers leading to the nuclear storage building always makes my hands sweat. And when you're actually in the storage building, there's this part where you can't be seen or use weapons. Otherwise, the room seals off and you begin choking on poison gas. My fingers never look forward to the torture sequence. You mash the fuck out of the circle button to keep your health up. And Ocelot zaps you a lot of fucking times. And if you don't want the bad ending, you can't give up. But the real torture are the two moments where backtracking rears its ugly head. One instance where you have to leave an injured Meryl behind to get a sniper rifle to do with Sniper Wolf, and the other instance where you have to go back and forth between a few areas to change the shape of the POW key using different temperatures. The sniper rifle bit just feels like clunky storytelling. I feel there could have been a better way to separate Snake and Meryl for story purposes. The temperature changing shit? You guys already know what I thought about that in Metal Gear 2. It's no different here, and they brought it back. <laughs> That classic alert sound was a goddamn jump scare during my early days. Just when I thought I was careful enough, that split second shriek informed me that I fucked up and now I'm running away like a dope. I should have been more cautious, but sometimes it's out of my hands, which is why I never liked that communications tower bit. It goes on a little long, it's awkward as hell to control going upstairs even with analog control, fuck you Matt. And unless you have a huge supply of stun grenades, keeping the oncoming soldiers down is a bitch. At least the climb down the second tower is less painful, all I have to do is hold down the d-pad. Every other time, there's always a means to get by without getting detected. It's just a matter of you knowing how to use your surroundings to your advantage. But there might be times you may feel the need to use a weapon, and as always, there's a considerable number of options. Snake's upgraded his personal offense a bit. Now he can perform a three-hit combo on enemies, but keep in mind, this won't kill anyone now. Just temporarily knock them out. He can now also fucking judo toss enemies to defend himself. It even works on some bosses. But again, this doesn't kill, just incapacitate. Nope, that's what this is for. <laughs> Any guard you can sneak up behind can be taken out by snapping their neck. It's quick, it's quiet, and leaves no mess, since bodies vanish into thin air when guards die. It's often recommended that you avoid combat altogether, since this is an infiltration mission after all, and I wholeheartedly agree with that, but I think Metal Gear Solid tries to have its cake and eat it too. MGS sells itself as a stealth game from start to finish, but as events transpire, Snake is forced into battle on occasion. It could be a boss fight or some random soldiers, and this is where I think things get clumsy. In a highly tense moment, it could be sort of awkward trying to connect your punches and kicks, since there's a small delay between stopping and attacking. If you don't connect with that first hit, that means you're probably about to get hit yourself. Weapons like the Socom or the Famas pack a lot of damage, but the auto-aim isn't very reliable, and unless you know of a certain trick to move and shoot at the same time, something the game doesn't tell you how to do, Snake is at a complete standstill when using guns. You can't, you know, really dodge things when you're a sitting duck. Controversial as this may sound, I think you really feel the sluggishness of combat during most of the boss fights. Combat is not the point of Metal Gear Solid, but that's what most of the fights amount to. Nearly mindless sessions of back and forth. Even Psycho Mantis, who's notable in his own way, goes down in an anticlimactic fashion once you figure out the trick to beating him. A number of them are quite stunning. The standoff against the Hind D and Metal Gear Rex are very memorable, but Vulcan Raven, in my opinion, has the best fights. They're successful combinations of both stealth and combat more fitting to the theme of the game. It's a little rough around the edges nowadays, but my adoration for Metal Gear Solid is about as strong now as it was then. It has good pacing, even with the added emphasis on dialogue. Stealth is more rewarding than before thanks to the shift to 3D, which naturally comes with its own benefits and challenges. And for a PS1 game, it has damn good production values. I love replaying this with the bonus items you get for completing the game with both endings, like the stealth camouflage, making you invisible to everything except bosses, or the bandana, which gives you infinite ammo. And do I need to explain why I love playing a snake in the tuxedo? But now that I've played Metal Gear 2 before this, I was more aware of the thing Solid reused, but I don't think that's the right word to use there. I would say refined. It's true that it could be interpreted as a sign of laziness, but let's face it, not a whole lot of people play the original games on the MSX. Metal Gear Solid was Kojima's second chance at sharing a story he couldn't fully flesh out before, and now he had a bigger audience with the PlayStation. Solid is everything Metal Gear 2 was, but more. Now, I still recommend Metal Gear 2 for being a good stealth game, but you can absolutely begin your Metal Gear binge with Solid. But as Liquid would say, It's not over yet! Metal Gear Solid was a huge hit. In 1999, Japan would get a re-release titled Metal Gear Solid Integral. It was pretty much the English version of the game with all the added features because apparently the original Japanese release didn't have things like different difficulties or even the first person mode. That had to have sucked. But Integral contained bonus features we Americans didn't get at first because Japan loved doing that sort of shit, like an alternate costume for Meryl, two hidden codec frequencies containing Easter eggs, and some mini games utilizing the Japanese only Pocket Station, a device similar to that of the Dreamcast's virtual memory unit. 
Another thing that it came with was a separate disc containing over 300 virtual missions. In Metal Gear Solid, you can play some virtual missions from the title screen to get accustomed to Snake's new controls and all that, but there were only about 10 of them, so it was nothing more than a tutorial. The 300 virtual missions here place Snake in a huge variety of different win conditions, requiring the player to get the most out of their abilities or arsenal to achieve victory. Americans wouldn't get the integral version of MGS until the PC release of the game in 2000, but good luck finding that without destroying your wallet. However, the virtual missions were separately released in 1999 for Americans under Metal Gear Solid VR missions. Now I'll be quick with this one. This has appeal but not on the same level as the original MGS. There's no story, it's just VR missions, and some of the shit Snake has to do to win is hilarious. Playing bowling with an Akita missile, finding out who ate the dead man's sea salt ice cream, it looks like a oh, fuck this shit. How about battling 100 foot genome soldiers? Because you never know when Snake's gonna run into those. VR missions has humor and I love that, but there's very little substance here for something that shares the Metal Gear name. It's also odd that despite being on the cover and title screen, Gray Fox is only available in three of the 300 missions, and you have to play so many other missions just to unlock these, and they're not even that fun, honestly. I guess I can kill the rest of my time taking pictures of Naomi and Mei Ling. This is an odd time sink, but it's funny to imagine Snake as a freelance photographer. Yeah, yeah, that's good, Naomi. You're lost, you're confused, you're thinking about revenge. Yeah, type on that keyboard. I bet you're not even really typing anything, but nobody knows about that, nobody knows about that. Ha, uh -huh. you just went on Google Images with Safe Search off, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't even know I could bend that way either. Yeah, that's it, Mei Ling. Walk in place. It's like a reverse moonwalk, which, which I guess is like regular walking. But yeah, hold still and done. It's good for a distraction and it doesn't cost much to get now. You can get it for about six bucks in the PlayStation Network and you can get Metal Gear Solid on the PSN as well. That goes for around 10 bucks. For the final game of today's video, let's take a quick look at Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes, the 2004 remake for the Nintendo GameCube. I was gonna wait until after I covered Metal Gear Solid 2 to go into this one, but I might as well do it now while the topic is Metal Gear Solid 1. Silicon Knights of Eternal Darkness fame was put in charge of bringing the PlayStation Classic to the purple lunchbox, sporting a retooled script and higher quality graphics. The story is exactly the same as before, but holy mother of God, did someone love the shit out of the Matrix. The cinematography is extremely over the top, exploding with dramatic slowdown, intense camera work, and more stylized action that could make Bayonetta blink. As an action game, it's fantastic. As a Metal Gear game, it's fucking ridiculous. Snake jumps off of an active missile launched by the Hind D just so he can get a good shot. When Metal Gear Rex activates, Snake's first line of offense is to attack the giant fucking thing head on. What the fuck? fuck did he think he was gonna accomplish there? But by far the most over the top part is when Kenneth Baker tells Snake he forgot Meryl's Kodak number. Sorry, I forgot. Damn. Jesus, Snake, calm the fuck down. It's not something I find offensive. I'm not that much of a diehard Metal Gear fanboy who can't dare to look at a different interpretation. But if you're into the more down-to-earth tone of Metal Gear Solid, where magical ravens appear out of thin air, random cyborg ninjas show up, and having the ability to destroy a tank with nothing but grenades, Twin Snakes may make you raise an eyebrow. You've been playing Super Mario Sunshine, haven't you? But updated graphics are only a part of what you're getting. All the new gameplay features introduced in Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty were implemented, leading to a sort of hodgepodge of the two. I'm going to go more into detail on what those updates are in the Metal Gear Solid 2 review, but I can say right now, they absolutely break this game in half. They didn't change the level design to accommodate the new features, so Snake is kind of overpowered now. Being able to drop down ledges and hang on rails is another means of avoiding detection. The ability to shoot with guns in first person mode, this right here breaks the game by itself. And they give Snake new tranquilizer based weapons so he can put guards to sleep from a distance without having to kill anyone. The AI was given upgrades as well. They can spot Snake from further distances and different altitudes, and they can beef up security if they see something suspicious or see one of their men down. Yeah, bodies don't disappear now, so if you put someone to sleep or kill them, you gotta do something with that body if there are still other guards around. But even if you do that, their superiors over the radio may notice something's up when they don't get a response from their team. Twin Snakes has all of the workings to make an intense stealth game, but the foundation it was based on didn't have all these new features in mind, and without retooling that level design, the result is a very easy version of the original Metal Gear Solid. But it can still be a great time, hey, they even fixed some of the backtracking problems I had in the original. You can pick up a sniper rifle much faster to deal with Sniper Wolf, and changing the temperature of the PAL key can all be done in the same room now, thank you. It's definitely worthy enough to place inside your Metal Gear collection, but don't lose sleep if all you have is the PS1 game. It's also not cheap for an old game. I spent around 50 bucks to get this, and I can't find it at a lower price anywhere else. Man, it's been a long time since I made two hefty videos in a row. I think I'm out of practice, and we're not even halfway done yet.
But maybe things will get easier next time with Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. Thank you for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night and take care.